it's cold. In the echo chamber maybe one more time and this is a new video last couple three days I think we're repeats just to keep the flow going on the channel and um, we went and did the two-day fishing derby I think we caught eight or nine well no we probably caught about I don't know 60 fish <laughs> probably ranging in size from 10 inches to uh, about 12 pounds it's winter spring salmon winter Chinook salmon and they're smaller feeder sized fish but I think an 18 and a half pound salmon won the derby. Buddy of mine caught the second place fish right basically beside us. And holy shit, was it freezing cold. Not used to going out there and uh, having the boat. It was a blizzard at the dock <laughs> the first night. A lot of fun there. I think there was eight or 10 of us all stayed at the same place, my friend's place, and uh, had steak dinners. And fished hard, got frozen. It was all good. Came home with a couple brand new fishing rods and reels. It was good. Oh, and uh, get this one. So I had to run the boat up the, the Alberni Inlet uh, all the way out to basically the mouth to Banfield where the boat sits in the water. So I left to do that. And then Sarah drove. She headed out about an hour and a bit later. And then uh, she drove out and met us out there. Full on blizzard while she was driving out there too. And on that long logging road, the Bamfield Road. Get this one. So the next day, she goes, Oh yeah, I heard a scream when I was driving out yesterday, last night or whatever. I'm like, what? You what? You heard a scream? Yeah, it sounded like kind of like an elk, but it wasn't an elk, it was a lot louder. I'm like, and you're just telling me this now? <laughs> right. So get this one. She was stopped. There's a automatic um traffic light, mobile traffic light they're using as they work on that logging road and they're going to seal coat it for regular traffic. Anyway, she's sitting there, blizzard out, no vehicles around anywhere, 
And she said she heard this scream. And she has the windows up, music blaring as usual in her Tahoe. And she said she heard a loud scream from the passenger side of her vehicle on the high side of the road over top of everything. Crazy, right? And I'm like, and you're just telling me this now. She says, hey, I kind of forgot about it. <laughs> so there you go. There's an interesting little note taken, but it's actually the same area where First Nations guy told me he had a, a uh, tree basically thrown at him and the headlights driving down that road. Swerved to miss it. And I was well aware of my neighbor's employee and his friend were driving to Banfield and seeing this large red-haired being basically jump off the rocks on the left side of the road, hit the road, and bailed over the other side right in front of the car and kept on going. No shortage stuff going on there. It is what it is. Nothing new, right? What else? I met a bunch of people, new people come up to me, knew who I was at the Derby. Friendly good people. Started BSing with a First Nations guy that was standing beside me. And we just started talking about the fishing and then hunting. And he works for logging companies running greater out there and I finally said to him, I go, hey, you ever heard of that asshole on YouTube that talks about Sasquatch all the time? He's like, no. I go, okay, well, that's me anyway. So they go, oh, yeah. I go, what do you got? You know, any seen him? He goes, no, nah, I haven't seen him, but my uncle's got a whole pile of stories. And this man lived out of Pachina, where a few other First Nations friends of mine live that have seen the uh, these beings all around there for years. So that's my report from the people from this weekend. It's freezing cold out. I, did, I think I, I panned with the video once and I'll show it to you guys here while we're fishing. And those mountains in the background that's looking towards, first off the camera starts in the, the direction of pointing towards Tofino Yukula and then it pans all the way around. And as it goes around you see all the, the, the larger snow-capped mountains. Well those mountains have, if I could say that these beings live somewhere full-time, they live right there. 110% all the people I know who frequent all around those mountains in the communities um, they are there all the time uh, one native community that's at the base of those snow-capped mountains in the far distance they basically see them nightly driving on the dirt road to go home there you go that's all I got from me now listen to this we got some people speaking let's let us hear them Powell River Bigfoot which is on that side of the island straight across Hello Steve, hope you and your family are well. Feel free to use my name. Little backstory. I always loved fishing, camping, ATV in 2008. My best friend got me into hunting. First deer was a three-pointer, mainlander. Excuse me, that means I uh, got a three-point in the mainland of BC, not the island. Other than that, lots of deer off Texada Island. Over the past years I've gotten big on spring bear hunting, including a few LEH grizzly hunts. Okay, that would have been a little while back. Spring of 2012, I believe I was out in the afternoon up Goat Lake, Maine. That's a logging road. Approximately 23 kilometers where the Rainbow Maine goes off to the left. And sitting on the Goat Maine, you look across the logging block and see the Rainbow Maine Road. This road eventually goes into a tree line. While spotting... While spotting, typo, something big, this must have meant we've seen something big and black, but on two feet. And it caught my eye at the tree line. I think it was a black bear, but in my mind, I know it wasn't. I decided to drive down there. I'm packing a 338 wind mag, but I'm also by myself, like most of the time. I get out, walk in a bit, and I've seen big human-like tracks in the mud but way too big to be human. Getting a bad feeling, I look around and this gut crunching growl comes out of the bush and I took off. I go down, turn around, and I notice a, I notice a pedal bike hidden off in the bush. On my way down, I ran into the CO, that's a conservation officer, game warden, and he's a native fellow. And I told him what I'd seen and witnessed and he didn't seem bothered at all. I now live up in Northern BC and work logging not a day go, goes by that I can't vision that creature perfectly in my mind. Sorry for bad spelling. I would have got my wife to, to fine read and edit, but I never told her. Very few people know. Thanks, Kevin Ede. Kevin, appreciate you, man. Powell River. If you'd asked around people living in Powell River, you would have came up with dozens of, of the similar experiences you had, man. That's just 
It's just, it's just the way it is. They are there, Powell River thick. Thick with sightings all along that chunk of coast, all the way to Squamish and farther north, right? And another member of the club and overturn, right you guys? Another member of the club and overturn. This club is frickin' huge. Huge and grows by the frickin' minute. There's Tuttle Sasquatch. Hey Steve, this is Jack Willis. I live in Washington State. Here's a photo of a right arm of a Sasquatch that breezed right beside me as I was standing in an empty five acre, five acre field taking a picture of the full moon. I took three photos right in a row, bam, bam, bam. And this was on the last photo I took. I smelled something, even felt the wind off of him when he passed, but I never seen him. But I think that's his elbow and I'm over six foot and I was standing. So his elbow was at least six and a half feet off the ground. I have more than this with different stories, but I about shat my pants when I seen this hairy arm and the other two pics had only the moon. That would be a little alarming, without a doubt. That's a crazy experience, man. And you see you got more than this. Send it. Send it all in. We want to hear everything you got, all right? Make sure you send what you've learned, what you've experienced, and send it. The people want to hear. And that does definitely does not sound impossible, without a doubt, from what we've heard from hundreds of other people, right? That's very, very interesting and very, very random. What are the chances of that happening at the same time, right? Crazy. Crazy. Here's another one more photo. This is titled Owl Man. Steve, I'm sending off, I'm sending all my deepest respect for you and the How to Hunt family. Your channel is my go-to every day. I hope the Owl Man is listening because I have questions for him. Around last fall, my daughter and her teenagers started having strange things going on orbs, strange noises at night. Then she noticed large dirty footprints on her front porch, bare footprints, larger than any human, anything human. She lives in a suburban area of northern Indiana. She also found huge handprints on her front sliding glass doors. I've sent pics before, I'll do something again. A week ago, everyone was woken up by strange, loud noise in the hallway. Everyone got up and looked in the hallway. My daughter, her son, and daughter were the only ones in the house. While they were all standing there trying to figure out what the noise was, my granddaughter's personal alarm went off. It's only activated when the nylon cord is pulled free. The personal alarm was across her room, nowhere near the hallway. And this was the latest incident. Personal alarm, I don't even know what, I don't even know what that is myself, you guys, alright? There's been a few times that they were woken up to someone heavy running in the house with the few pics she has taken. It does show a strange outline of something invisible with the strange blurry waves. As a matter of fact, two or three of them blurry, big outlines inside her house four days ago. My granddaughter finally seen one. She was facing the dining room entrance from the family room when a dark, furry face looked around the corner. It was at least eight feet tall. Wow. They made eye contact for a brief moment, then realized she could see it. He slash she quickly ducked back out of sight. My granddaughter yelled for her mom. It was gone in the blink of an eye. It seems that there is two or three juvenile sabe making themselves at home with my daughter and her family. They found black walnut halves in the house. There are no black walnut trees. There are no black walnut trees, trees there. Plus, no one eats them. My question is to the owl man. It's like they just showed up out of nowhere. Is it unusual for young Sabby to be with a family? I think they feel safe at my daughter's home. Even the dogs, cats, ferrets, and rabbits are not freaked out by the activities and blue orbs that come and go. My granddaughter seems to be much of the focus to them. They have tapped on her head like an annoying sibling would do for annoyance. My granddaughter's 15, my grandson is 13. Is there any way Owl Man can speak with these Sabe or help my daughter speak with them? Sabe are not the only strange things occurring there, but there has nothing, but there has nothing to do with Sabe issues. Any help would be much appreciated, thank you. Just for you, Steve. Pass on, all right. All right, 
appreciate it. Uh, again, I've mentioned this before, Scott Carpenter's had good luck helping people get, get a grip somewhat with the property and some strange things going on. These fingerprints look a lot like what was mailed in, what happened on the side of a vehicle window. And I'll, uh, I'll post up these photos anyway. Sounds bizarre to me. It's, it's out of, uh, I don't have the answers for you myself, but there's people here that probably do. And they're probably listening and they'll I'm sure they'll chime in uh, in the comment section below the video, all right? I strongly believe there's a lot more going on than just the, uh, the forest people and myself. There's too much evidence of some crazy ass shit in that Skinwalker Ranch is uh, a good example, right? Interesting and creepy and alarming and scary. That's all I can say about this, and I hope someone here can throw you some advice or some help. Now, who's next, man? I'm tired. I am beat. A couple days getting up early and going at her. Beat the crap out of me. Gotta get myself conditioned to it again pretty quick. Fishing all day. <clears throat> Excuse me. Short true story in central New York. My name is Keith Kimpton. You can use my name as my story is true. Three decades ago, my 15 year old and I went to Fish Creek to await opening day of walleye pike season just three miles from home. We hiked into private land and started a small fire on the rocks of the creek for some light. Just before the midnight opening came, we heard an unknown howl far upstream. Two minutes later from the creek, not 50 feet away, a roar so loud it shook us to our cores, hit us louder than anything I've ever heard before. I knew then it was time to leave. We cut through the buck brush to the truck and tore out of there like our lives depended on it. And I believe our lives did indeed depend on it. Months later, my son saw the beast standing next to our garage looking at him. My son told me, it knows where we live, Dad. I knew he was right. And we knew where he lived. A stalemate was achieved. My son, in his 40s now, won't talk about it anymore, but his eyes still shows the fear we endured that April night so long ago. That's alarming. Well, Keith, you might want to uh, possibly send this video to your son, <clears throat> excuse me, with a little encouragement to watch it just so he knows that he's not alone, he's not crazy. And there is a lot of people talking about this shit to get to the bottom with it and help each other. All right, so you might want to try, try that one out. And uh, you know, like I've mentioned earlier, like you need to gather like your life depended on it. And I've mentioned earlier, no matter how terrifying it sounds, anything that wants to kill or destroy you is not going to give you a verbal warning like this and let you run to the vehicle. All right? It's just not. They're not. They're not. There isn't a predator alive that's going to pre-warn you to get away if it wants to annihilate your ass. You're not going to hear nothing from anything. It's usually the way it goes, right? You're not going to hear anything when it comes to something wanting to kill you dead. You're probably not going to hear shit. I think. But anyway, appreciate the email. Make sure you send it off to your son, all right? Bring him a little bit of comfort anyway, hopefully. Wild Montana experience with Mind Speak. Hello all, this is my second email with my family's Bigfoot experiences. My first email was my own experiences titled RH Blood that has not been read yet. In that email, I mentioned my experiences with a lizard. I also mentioned that my dad had his own stories. I've been given permission from my dad and sister to tell the stories. They are avid listeners and are the ones that turn me on your channel. They, however, are technologically challenged. <laughs> me too. My dad, many years ago, moved his bed outside out onto his balcony. I know, weird, but he absolutely loves it out there. He loves listening to the night noises. The night is very active. He lives on the edge of a mountain range on about 40 acres, but he has heard whoops and screams many times over the years. About three years ago, right before dawn, he heard a female whoop, thinking female because it's higher pitched close by around his neighbor's place, which is probably a quarter mile away. This neighbor came out with what sounded like a 22 and shot it. Then a deeper male whoop happened on the other side of this guy's house. His neighbor had to have, his neighbor had to have gone back inside his house and come up with a bigger gun and shot it. More whoops happened. Then again, a bigger gun was brought out and shot. 
This happened several times over and then stopped at dawn. My dad was super excited and tried to record this event, but my, but my niece, his granddaughter, who was living there, did not cooperate. She thought he was playing a trick on her because this just happened to occur on April's Fool's, April Fool's Day, LOL. So she did not give her phone to him. To this day, he is still bitter with her, LOL. <laughs> my sister was gifted and some years back, she started talking to an adolescent while she waited for her daughter to come home off the school bus. She just knew there was a young one around and watching. She would randomly talk about anything, just chatting, chattering really, and being friendly. She did, she did this for about five months. This adolescent started leaving pine cones in the mailbox. My sister left them all in the box, but each day another pine cone was added. At one point, five were left, one in each corner and one placed on top of and directly in the middle of, the pack of a package. She thought about interacting and leaving a gift as well, but decided against it. She knew that was probably a bad idea, and once an exchange like this starts, it is for life. A commitment she did not want to make. So she stopped talking and was going to let them be. The mailman is the one who threw them all out of the box, lol. A few years passed, my sister and dad decided to walk on the back side of the property. This entire area is overrun with bears and mountain lions, so my dad took his gun. On this walk, my sister kept pointing out broken branches, as in already broken off smaller branches, broken into half and hanging from tree branches. So envision seeing an upside down V. The trees were covered in these placed hanging V sticks. My sister said they were all low and eye level, which tells me these were placed to be seen. That evening, my sister was already in bed and my parents were watching YouTube videos watching your YouTube videos at the table. Probably you. Oh, sorry. My parents were watching YouTube videos at the table. Probably you, LOL. My sister was mine spoke for the first time. They were angry about my dad having the gun on their walk earlier that day. Pissed. They kept showing her images of the gun and the projected anger over it. My sister was telling them it was not for them, but for protection from bears or mountain lions. She was protecting she was projecting a heart around the gun. Right after this happened, a pumpkin smashed. This was a large pumpkin on the second or third step of the staircase, which is right on the other side of the front door, and my sister's bedroom is at the top of these stairs. But my parents, who were sitting at the table, excuse me, was only feet from the stairs. They did not see anything, albeit they were engrossed in something on the computer, LOL. But this pumpkin was smashed to pieces. Like it was picked up above one's head and smashed to the ground with force. Both my parents jumped as my dad said the floor shook from the sheer force of this pumpkin hitting the floor. Number one, there is no way a pumpkin of this size rolled down two or three steps. And two, even if it did happen to roll down, there's no way it would have smashed into nothing. At one point, there's even a portal on my dad's property. Present, open and active for about a week. My sister could see it keep a good eye on that area and was very happy to see it gone one day. She did not see anything come out or leave from it when she checked on it, but it being there for over a week, I'm sure something did many times. I hope this helps someone as knowledge is power. Thanks for all you do for the people, Tamara. Tamara, that is some crazy ass shit going on at your place. And if that house shook, I would imagine it either slapped it with its hand or stomped it with its foot to shake the house, right? You know what, a lot of stuff sounds absolutely crazy and bizarre and hard to wrap your bean around, but there's way, it's a pattern. There's too many patterns here. There's way, way, way too many people are reporting the same shit in the rural properties and literally thousands of miles separating each, each homestead and nobody being in contact or relating with each other in any way and the same things happening, right? Crazy. Well, this is one. This is titled, Meeting the People, Doors Open. I asked Stephen to use my name. I'm not concerned with non-believer's opinions. I'm Don Paul, P-A-U-L-L -L of Seashell, B.C. Straight across from the island, other side. Shit piles of uh, sightings going on all along that coast, as just mentioned in your power room. 
You likely know of the area, also not that it makes a difference. I'm native. I grew up to a ripe age of 13 years old hearing the stories of the people, the wild man. I said grew up to the age of 13 hearing of the people, that is because at 13, myself and a friend first met them, and I'm now in my 60s. Being a coastal boy, I was learning to hunt at an early age, used air rifles to hunt grouse around 10 years old, fished for the family to stock up on canned salmon and cod. There are many things I do not have an explanation for, which as time goes I'll, on, I'll try to add to the round table of knowledge. Thank you in advance for that. Times were a lot different back then in the 70s. No one really cared if you had a hunting rifle walking down the highway. Yeah, today they'll, they gotta start bawling their eyes I go to a safety room, right? <laughs> Sorry. So my friend, as I asked him for his okay to use his name, haven't heard back as of yet, will remain just a friend. It started in early fall. We had planned to hike halfway up the mountain from home to go deer hunting, so we left fairly early, still dark, about 45 minutes. Minus 1.0 hour before sun up. We're hiking along a trail slash decommissioned logging road for about a, for about a half an hour. We were walking along quietly. The sun was up, it was daylight, and we stopped at the same time, both of us looking to the left. There, standing in the bush, about 20 feet away, was a wild man. We stood staring at each other. 20 feet. So that's the length of a vehicle, you guys. That's a car length away. Pickup truck, whatever. I don't have any idea how long we stared at each other. It was a minute at least. One of us said, do you see it? We continued to stare and I said, yes, I see it. The very strange part is neither of us felt any concern, no threat of any kind. I actually felt kind of at peace. We just continued on with the hunting trip, which wasn't successful that day. One week later, because we decided to leave too late in the day to get to the area we wanted to hunt, we left two hours before sun up. This was likely a very bad idea. We were about 45 minutes from town along the very same trail we had seen the wild man the week previous. It was completely dark and neither of us carried a flashlight, so couldn't be accused of pit lamping. The stars were out, which helps us see the direction of the trail. All was going as planned up to where we had met the Sasquatch the week earlier. We could hear things in the bush following us along. At first, not too close, then the sounds multiplied upward of eight or more all around us. We continued walking until we came to a crossroad in the trail, which gave us a little more space. The Sasquatch were screaming for some time now. We sat back to back in the middle of the tee in the trail. Our plan was to wait till daylight, about an hour away. Might as well have been a day away. The Sasquatch were getting more agitated and angry sounding, if that was possible. I was packing a Lee Enfield and my friend a 22 Cooey. It's funny, those are both the same first guns I ever owned too. Single, single shot Cooey in a 303 Enfield. We couldn't take the pressure anymore and decided they wanted us out of there. I said, let's walk out of here. At this time, neither of us thought we were going to see sunrise. I fired two rounds from my rifle into the treetops to let them know we would defend ourselves. We chambered around and leveled our guns in front of us and started walking out. We said, you bump into anything, squeeze the trigger. It was still pitch black. We felt better once we made it to the power lines, being more open and more ambient light. Yes, they chased us all the way to the power lines. We could hear them moving back and forth along the tree line, letting us know they weren't done with us yet. I'm not sure if my friend caught a glimpse of them at the tree line. I did. They're freaky fast. So as we decided to leave and walk straight down center of the power line to give ourselves a better field of fire, more because we were scared shitless, lol. They, I guess, had enough teasing us and stopped shortly after we started down the power line. We had hiked for some time, feeling like we might get out of this in one piece. The Sasquatch stopped following us, or at least we couldn't hear them. We were a couple miles from town and heard a couple things moving in the bush. Neither thought it was the people. Oh, sorry. We were a couple miles from town and heard a couple things moving in the bush. Neither thought it was the people. They stopped shouting us earlier. Being young and thinking we were not sure, 
we were thinking but decided these noise were bears and they were getting close to town. My friend shot two rounds into the treetops too, we thought. Oh, sorry, to scare the bear back up the hills away from town. Shortly after he shot his rifle, both noises stopped. I then saw a young Sasquatch run towards the larger sound between some trees. Oh my God, doesn't cover it. I said to Buddy, run. We ran all the way to my house on the res, not stopping once. Once home, we were talking to my mother, who, as you can imagine, has questions as to why we ran in the back door out of breath. My friend and I decided to draw what we saw the week before. My mother asked us to. We drew the exact same thing down to a branch that was beside the Sasquatch. We decided, mother told me, not to go into the bush for a while. It wasn't much argument from either of us, as you can imagine, lol. We both continued to enjoy the outdoors. We had many more encounters with these wild men. I believe that some have mentioned once you are marked, once you are marked, you're on the radar. I agree. I also believe they have been at a few of our camps and watched over us as we slept. I'll add more recounts of the people, both personal and stories I've heard from family members. There, there are a lot, for lack of a better description, serpents in the ocean as well. Some I've seen other stories of family members have experienced. Thank you to all in the round table, and a special thanks to you, Steve, for making this possible. If you ever find your way to the Sunshine Coast, let me know. The door is open. You and your family, Don Paul. I'll be there, man, for sure. Thank you so much for that invite, and I will be there. Just don't know when. Uh, I went there, uh, I think I went there solo two years ago. I think I went over to look at a boat in Gibson's or Seashell or something. And then I'm like, well, I'm here now. I'm going to go rip around because Half Moon Bay, you know where that is? <clears throat> Half Moon Bay, there is just absolute insanity going on around there. And I went, I went down Half Moon Bay and I went up, cut up a logging road and I went up to those power lines. And I uh, went down the power lines till I almost got stuck in a bog. <laughs> and then I turned around and uh, went back up. And there's a couple of roads that went up into the timber and I followed that for a little bit, but I got chopped off. But I went looking around there. Big timber there, eh, man? Big timber. Big, long, sloping slopes. And uh, I'd be really curious to get back into the mountains from there. I got a couple of friends who live on the islands and they, uh, they go sledding. They're sledding right now up in those, the bigger mountains farther in from the coast. Pretty rugged in there, isn't it? And they also, these same friends have found footprints in the snow on Gambier Island, right? Found footprints in the snow and I've shared that footprint photograph quite a few times on here using the thumbnails or whatever. But anyway, please email back with as much as you can or all you got, all right? Because I am really curious, and I know a lot other more people will be curious here too. Especially, I mean, you're basically, we're neighbors, right? And uh, I want to hear more. And I wouldn't mind coming over there too, again. I just don't know when, right? <laughs> I need like 10 lifetimes to do all the shit I want to do. Man, I was thinking about the other day if I could take cut two months of time just to go ripping around road tripping from one end of North America to the other and seeing people and seeing new country and videotaping it and share it with everybody, I wouldn't a second. I got so much shit to do, man. I need, I need 10 lifetimes to do all the things I want to do. But anyway, super glad you emailed that in. And I hope you email again real quick with, with a lot more. I'm really curious about uh, that that country, that area. I've been up, uh, I've been, I've ran around there quite a bit as well. Oh man, what's the name of that? There's that inlet, boat access only with the elk draw in there between Gibsons and Squamish, McNabb Creek, McNabb Creek. I don't know, some tracks being found in the back of McNabb, I've been back in there. And that's pretty nasty, rugged and secluded in there too, right? I went in there to help somebody get an elk years back that's how I ended up in there but anyway I gotta wake up I gotta go get my coffee in me get my ass in gear I gotta get all that lumber the old fence rails pulled out and pressure wash them off and uh, get them cut in and sheeted in the room back here so I can get out of this echo chamber get that going and uh, keep on getting my shit done so I can free up some time and and I'm thinking I am possibly going to 
Sarah doesn't want me to, but um, I can't stop myself. But I think I'm going to uh, get my stuff done right now, see what weeks I can possibly do this, and I'm just going to load my truck up and head to the U.S. border and see if I can drive across. And if I do drive across, then it's game freaking on. I'm going to go everywhere. Everywhere. Anyway, I'm back. Be a little more organized and get a lot more shared shortly.